Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this very special fifth seminar. Today, we are very happy to have Professor Biondo Biondi joining us. Um, Professor Biondo, uh, Biondo Biondi is uh, funny and is Dale Morris Professor of Geophysics. And uh, he is also the director of Stanford Exploration Project, a very, uh, very known uh, academic consortium in exploration geophysics. Founded by an uh, MIT alumni, Joan Clairbot. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Biondo and his students devised several novel seismic image methods for the exploration scale. And uh, he's very well known for his work in 3D seismic seismology and uh, also some latest work like the dust uh, position in Stanford, on Stanford campus. And uh, Professor Biondi, please start with that. Okay. Oh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, I'm afraid that doesn't Zoom see, well, I thought you see that. Uh, how can I remove it? Do you know? Sorry? Click on participants. How do I, where is view here? Now that is, I think is the PowerPoint. So people see your PowerPoint presentation. They don't see this video. Yeah, but I'm yeah, thinking but about you guys. Yeah. Uh, that's maybe this. No. Uh, maybe you can try to apply the background So okay, let me get this. That's okay. No, not any. Let me stop sharing. Let me see. Let me maybe I maybe I cannot minimize this. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, but the problem now I don't know how to share though <laughs> if I minimize it. Uh, if anybody's I never experienced this, so if anybody knows what to do, please. Don't, I will not get offended if I. This view when you enlarge the zoom and then you. Yeah, and the view on the top right. Okay. You can maybe speaker or hide your hide, hide self view, no hide non video participant full screen. Let me say just the speaker now doesn't help. Well, let me try to do share again. Yes. Maybe it's, that's share again. I need to find the PowerPoint. No, it's still there. Uh, Would you just click on participants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. oh, maybe here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. That's better than before. Yeah. Uh, then I do this. Okay. Kind of. Kind of. Okay. <laughs> uh, apologies for everybody online and the uh, people here. Kind of technical problem always happen, particularly if you have a change of venue at the last moment. And uh, uh, so as you heard, I am a seismic imaging person, but I really got excited about the potential of DAS for seismic imaging, but also for monitoring the environment where monitoring is in a broad sense, uh, can be monitoring a carbon sequestration project as well uh, monitoring our cities. I think that uh, potentially the DAS technology has a lot of advantages that have to do with the data density, with the cost per amount of monitoring, and also the uh, resilience and the durability of the sensor themselves. But uh, not showing here, but we recorded data in a borehole that uh, the fiber had been there for 12 years. And we went there, touched the interrogator, and uh, the uh, data came out. So that is, uh, they are really, nice advantages of the DAS as a seismic sensor. Uh, we started the, uh, the project here, it's kind of little jumbled the uh, image, but uh, we started uh, uh, the idea with uh, uh, recording data under Stanford campus in 2016, uh, was a teeny tiny array uh, for the one of you that uh, know the Stanford campus. That is where Mitchell Aerosciences is. That is where my office is. Uh, the, all together, this is about three kilometers. 
uh, of, uh, of the fiber. And uh, uh, from uh, then on, uh, we uh, kept going, uh, recording more and more data in different places. Uh, we have enlarged the Stanford array now is uh, about 48 kilometers uh, of fiber lease line from the telecom uh, companies nearby Stanford through Stanford IT services. And uh, that is not an exact map, but the given idea is basically go from main campus to uh, the Red City uh, uh, facility. And quite interesting goes also the uh, Slack, the linear accelerator up the hill from, uh, from Stanford. And it goes even through close to the faculty housing is actually running 100 meters away from my own home. So one of the things that I want to do if I can follow myself biking home or not, I've not tried yet. Uh, in between, also, we recorded data in many other places under the ocean, but also in San Jose in the uh, uh, spring uh, in the early summer of 2021. That is the path of the way in San Jose, and uh, we'll show you some of the results in San Jose. Uh, the idea here is that modern cities have fiber everywhere, and uh, uh, there is opportunity to build a network of a seismic sensor. I call it a, a, a little ambitiously, but not that much, a, the billion sensor array project. And I have to say that uh, we are kind of scaling up for 2016, uh, that was few thousand part, uh, sensor. Now with one interrogator, you can interrogate 100,000 uh, sensors. And uh, so we are more or less online what I, I jokingly said back then that I want to build better way before that I retire. So I may have to adapt a little bit my retirement age. Uh, that's uh, need to talk with my wife about that, I guess. Uh, the, uh, this is the result of the latest array that we have around Stanford campus. Uh, that's, uh, it was a, a local earthquake and uh, uh, you can see the arrivals. Uh, the uh, S very clearly, the P is a uh, uh, little uh, less so, but uh, anyway, you do see uh, that we just came out of the box after a couple of days that we installed it. And uh, uh, the first, uh, these are not the only people that are working on the project, but uh, really uh, uh, the one that uh, maybe happens, Eileen first. She is the one that really started in 2016. She was my student, uh, and now she is uh, an assistant prof at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, don't know if you know much about SCP and Bob Club, but anything that has to do with uh, computing, HPC, huge data, have, uh, Bob has always a huge contribution uh, uh, at SCP. Uh, Fantine was uh, our machine learning uh, person. She is now working at uh, Google in Amsterdam. Uh, Bin Lu is, uh, uh, was a postdoc, now he is uh, an assistant prof in China, and C11 is uh, hopefully graduating soon. The, uh, so this is more or less what uh, I will uh, uh, um, kind of follow the uh, plan for the talk. Uh, what is that should do in terms of timing, Lauren? I think we can definitely go until 1.30, but probably a bit afterwards, right? Maybe 1.45, so okay for everybody. Yeah. Okay, 145. So I will try to kind of, I may go and skip some of the parts uh, and some of the details because we have 45 minutes uh, and then probably some time for question. So what is DAS? I will explain uh, 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 pretty uh, simply what it is, uh, how different it is from uh, the seismologist in the room and on Zoom, how different it is from uh, conventional geophone data, and in what way. Uh, then I will discuss some of the challenges of uh, urban seismology by DAS. And then I, I will present uh, uh, four potential applications. One thing that is quite interesting that we started with the uh, uh, idea of listening to earthquakes, and uh, that is now a relatively small uh, things of what we do because the, the DAS data, in particular, recorded 
uh, in urban environment is so rich and has so many uh, interesting components that uh, uh, we kept finding a new interesting application for the problem. Uh, the, uh, what is DAS? Uh, uh, first, before that, I kind of describe uh, uh, more technically, this is an example of uh, DAS data. Uh, as typical seismology data, we do have time uh, going down and the uh, sensor location is uh, on the horizontal uh, uh, axis. Uh, this was a recording in San Jose, uh, in our San Jose experiment. Uh, it has an earthquake, that is the nice thing of recording data in California. Uh, you can always count some, some earthquake happening. Uh, that was a, a local earthquake that you see right there. The, uh, these are uh, signatures of vehicles going around the road, and we'll discuss a little more in details what they really mean. And then you do have infrastructure of different kind. This is a, a bridge over uh, US 101 that is uh, really busy uh, freeway all the time. And uh, you record basically the vibration of the, uh, of the bridge as well, a uh, little less easy to see the surface wave generated uh, uh, that they propagate for a few kilometers uh, generated by the vibration of the bridge. Of course, also you record uh, uh, not only uh, anthropogenic or earthquake data, but also micro, what is known micro sized uh, uh, waves uh, that are uh, well known since the 50s, the 60s, uh, are basically uh, seismic waves generated by the interaction of uh, ocean waves with the solid earth that have been used for interferometry and uh, uh, of imaging. And this is an example at the proper frequencies of uh, those uh, micro size uh, recorded uh, by uh, the, uh, the DAS system. Uh, for the reflection seismologist, I like to say that uh, uh, DAS is really a reflection seismology experiment uh, done with laser instead of uh, 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 seismic waves. Because uh, the basic idea is that uh, you do have uh, uh, heterogeneities in the fiber cables, and like you do have in heterogeneities in the in the earth. And you send a source, a pulse that uh, goes in, into the cable. And the, those heterogeneities of the cable backscattered the, uh, the laser light back to the uh, origin. And uh, by the uh, basically the time of flight, uh, you can, could determine the heterogeneities in the cable. In this case, uh, really, we just, what we are interested is uh, uh, looking at how the heterogeneities get a little closer and farther apart from each other. And that's basically me measure the strain on the cable. And uh, so we don't look and we don't image those heterogeneities that we'll do in reflection seismology, but uh, uh, what uh, uh, by the process of interferometry, so basically is for the seismologists that work on interferometry is basically you cross correlate this also with the receivers and uh, uh, that basically with uh, 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 some more complex system and making it easy, uh, but uh, uh, you measure how the strain of the cable and that is the basic idea. This is a nice video, it's a snapshot from a video that was generated by a group by uh, Elita. I'm mentioning Elita because uh, uh, she was my student, postdoc here with Laurent. She was professor at the uh, uh, University in Singapore and recently moved to uh, Purdue. And the video was really produced by her uh, postdoc, Gan Fang. Yes. Uh, different interrogators have a different uh, way of thinking. And doing it is a chirp, a square wave, and uh, uh, there is all the literature of uh, patents and uh, uh, and so on. I mean, it's very interesting to look at that. But is uh, 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 we seismologists we tend to use as a black box, knowing the limits. For example, you can saturate if you do have uh, uh, you understand the term cycle skipping. I mean, if the uh, strain is too much then uh, you basically cycle skip you and then you do have actually a problem of saturation. So we need to understand what the limitations and the performance of the system are 
but indeed some of those details, not that I'm not interesting, but we may kind of not think about too much, but uh, different companies do different things because they have patent different way. And by the way, the technology was uh, uh, really developed by the navies uh, in the Western country. And a lot of the commercial company came out of the uh, Southampton lab in the UK. That was a Navy lab. They, uh, so how different is from uh, geophone data? That's exactly important. So the advantage is that cheap, doable, dense. Uh, the biggest disadvantage of uh, uh, that data is uh, uh, that uh, is just one component of the nine component tensor. So it is not like your three component geophones. And it's not even like your hydrophone for the one that work with marine uh, data. So that uh, is uh, something that we need to be aware of. And uh, uh, so it's really measuring uh, dynamic axial strain. Why the word dynamic there? Because there are other ways that they will actually measure the static strain that uh, is still using fiber optic sensing, but is different uh, physical phenomena that uh, they really backscattering that uh, does use. So it is a function of time, it can be very low frequency. We, for example, measure the teleseismic event and correlate with uh, seismometers at around 20 millihertz. So it's incredible how low frequency, but it really doesn't give you the DC of the strain. And can go up to four kilo, two kilohertz, or, or maybe even more. The, uh, so is if you want to learn more, go look at Eileen's thesis on our website, and uh, the, uh, you can learn more. I will go a little quickly. So is one component, and on the top of that is an average. What is it? so that is an important thing that we don't have with point sensor is what gauge length is basically you can think about averaging the strain over one meter, 10 meters, depends on the interrogator and how you set it. And most of it is done for signal to noise. So now the uh, gauge length, higher resolution the measure is, uh, however, uh, you may get uh, more noise. So it depends on the power of the interrogator, depends on the, how far you are interested to interrogate. So it, is really, and a lot of interrogator allows you to set those kind of parameters. So this would be the strain, I mean, strain is a tensor quantity, and uh, that's what is the component that you have uh, out of the nine components of the strain tensor. The, uh, that basically means that it has directivity. So uh, that it has the, the uh, for the P waves, there is a co-square Directivity. So that basically means that uh, uh, if your seismic P waves goes along the uh, cable, you have a perfect sensitivity. If it is orthogonal to the cable, this will tell you zero. In reality, there are second order effect, and you see more than zero. But uh, clearly, the directivity is uh, uh, highly directional. And then it has also for the uh, shear waves, uh, has uh, this uh, other uh, component. That, uh, that means that uh, really the period of, uh, is uh, half of the one that you see here, really, like this is a sine two data. So there is some uh, uh, polarity flipping that at the beginning kind of uh, puzzled us. And uh, when we we're looking at surface waves and like, S waves, but then we finally understood what was going on. And that is just graphic way of uh, defining uh, the directivity and the gauge length that means that the frequency response uh, is really depends on the, on the gauge length as well. So it's really you should think about wavelengths and how short or how long the wavelengths are compared to the gauge length. If uh, your wavelengths are uh, much longer than the gauge length, then is really you can think about almost as a point sensor. If uh, your wavelengths are much shorter, then uh, it really doesn't behave, and we need to think about uh, the gauge lengths. Uh, this is the directivity of the, of the uh, respect to the uh, PNS uh, waves. I don't think that we have really the time if we want to talk about the application. The interesting thing is this four lobes directivity uh, to the S waves, and so some of the components of the surface waves as well. 
compare, uh, uh, compare to the geophones. So that is something that you need to be aware and understand. And again, I think uh, Eileen's thesis is a good reference to ex understand those things. Uh, in uh, earth sciences, uh, the, uh, this kind of sensing has mostly been used in boreholes. Uh, the good quality data is uh, the fibers cemented uh, uh, outside of the cube of the boreholes, nice capping. Can be uh, vertical boreholes, like in the geothermal application on the left, and uh, or the um, horizontal boreholes, like the unconventional there. And uh, we work quite a bit about, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, micro seismic and the vent detection for both boreholes. And that has incredible opportunity as well to image at high resolutions of the subsurface. But I'm not going to talk about those more conventional earth science application. I'm talking about uh, more of the kind of the urban uh, seismology part. And uh, that has uh, a lot of additional challenges and opportunities. And as I said, uh, we are finding out more and more. Uh, the uh, sense of directivity, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, in urban environment, there are a lot of sources of seismic noise. And some of them are stationary, so somewhat is easier to deal with. Some of them are not stationary. They move around, they are on, they are off, and uh, uh, sometimes they interfere with the signal that you are interested. The uh, UVs are basically what we call uh, the dark fibers. So we are using basically piggybacking the existing telecom infrastructure. That is where potentially the billion sensor array may come uh, to be is really using the huge investment in fiber de deployment by the telecom industry. And uh, however, they are, when they put the fiber, they don't think about uh, your seismic application. And uh, so the, uh, the coupling and varying uh, the coupling between the fiber and the ground around it that basically support the wave propagation can uh, uh, vary dramatically. And we see some example. And uh, interesting enough, uh, also there is a, a, some uncertainties of where the cable is and uh, how long uh, uh, where the cable uh, uh, is pulled or not in different uh, manholes. Uh, this uh, is a uh, somewhat a headache, but is also what is giving us, uh, for example, the entry into the city of San Jose. They are really interested to do a mapping and uh, for maintenance purposes. And uh, so now lawyers are still kind of working on the document, but we will have access to hundreds and hundreds of miles of fibers owned by the city because of that particular uh, application of the mapping that we can actually do that mapping. So uh, this is an example of uh, 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 noise sources. Uh, this is uh, uh, under the linear accelerator uh, on the uphill from uh, Stanford. So there are pump noises of the building or traffic noise and the accelerator itself that is actually quite interesting. And the accelerator, by the way, has a fiber too. So we are talking with them about recording data uh, uh, while they are doing their uh, 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 high energy physics experiment. So stationary uh, uh, and non-stationary noise. Coupling can vary dramatically even uh, near by piece of fibers. So here is same data displayed in two different way with a different clipping, basically, uh, uh, or what is the dynamic range. Uh, with, uh, uh, if you want to image correctly the high amplitudes uh, data here uh, that in this frame uh, you basically uh, uh, you clip only the uh, very high amplitudes, but uh, uh, you don't see or basically no signal before and after uh, the channels before and after. Only if we uh, 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 really reduce the dynamic range and get closer to zero, then we start to signal. But is actually uh, there is a decent signal to noise. Very different amplitudes, but uh, region will signal to noise away from that region. So estimating uh, uh, the coupling is uh, uh, quite important and estimating even just the uh, amplitude response. 
the location, as I was saying, uh, uh, of the fiber. So this is the map of the fiber in San Jose that we interrogated. And uh, uh, here we can uh, uh, basically uh, uh, really create a mapping of the distance along the fiber. That is something that for maintenance is easy to measure uh, uh, to the physical location and sometimes can half uh, be off of hundreds of meters. So that is uh, using basically the signature of a vehicle going on the road and uh, uh, connecting that signature with the GPS signal in the car. And uh, uh, so that is what we call the elastic, the quasi-static elastic deformation. So as a cap, uh, uh, is on the road will uh, slightly deform the, uh, the surface since the fibers are really sensitive uh, instrument to the strain you will see basically the signature of the car moving along the road and that is a function of time and space and so you can uh, basically connect the two and now you have a, uh, a very high resolution mapping of the location of the fiber channel uh, to a location and uh, also where it gets lost so in this case, uh, you did uh, uh, had the manholes and uh, uh, about uh, uh, 70 meters of fibers was pulled inside there. And uh, so that is the region of that discontinuity there. So the, uh, uh, there is a, a distance along the fiber, but uh, no distance in terms of geographical location. And again, if you follow the cow, you can see exactly when it gets through the manhole, you can see that. And also you can see when, for example, the, uh, the fiber turns around. And uh, uh, as in this case, uh, you can follow the... Uh, uh, and the uh, uh, bigger uh, picture is that you can basically uh, not only map the fiber, and uh, through all its uh, uh, potential uh, challenges, but also you can follow the cars and that actually following traffic is one of the urban applications. Did you stop all the other traffic for just that one vehicle? How, how uh, this is, was uh, students driving at night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you just need to go drive around with the GPS, was, uh, is nothing more than that. Uh, so, what are the applications? One of that I think that uh, uh, once that we start to have dense array can be really huge is to have continuous mapping of the subsurface here under cities. So, if you do have a sinkhole uh, developing. Some areas, if you ever start to have a, 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 the ground, or some beginning of the landslides, or, or some other problem with the subsurface, uh, or if you have water, you probably have heard that uh, California had the deluge for three weeks at the beginning of the year, and so we now we have a very nice signal to analyze before the deluge, during, and after, and see what is uh, how we can measure. Uh, uh, water content in uh, the subsurface. And uh, all, all of this is based on the fact that uh, vehicles, as they uh, go on the road, they generate surface waves. And uh, for the geophysicists, I mean, surface waves, basically, they do uh, sensitive to mostly to the uh, shear velocity in uh, of the near surface. How deep you can go depends how low frequency it is. I mean, kind of rule of thumb is half of the wavelength uh, is the sensitivity of the surface waves. And uh, so now you can have uh, DS and potentially DP from surface wave dispersion analysis. You can also do what is uh, um, civil engineers do at sites is uh, 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 having the horizontal vertical uh, um, ratio of the spectrum and it gives you an idea of the, uh, of the depth of the, um, of the bedrock. 
that is uh, before buildings of a, a reasonable size uh, civil engineers will always do that and we had a paper with Zach speaker early on a few years about ago about how to do that but let's see how, what is the relationship between uh, uh, vehicles and uh, 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 surface waves so this is the signature of the cow going uh, along the road the big strong signal is the uh, elastic deformation that I, I, I discussed before. But now, if you look uh, carefully, we have this uh, uh, fishbone signal as well. And those are surface waves generated by the cow when it interacts with the uh, uh, irregular surface of the road. And uh, uh, if we uh, do uh, uh, the quasi static deformation can be used for track monitoring and for locating in time and space the source of the surface wave. So we don't need to do interferometry uh, because we'll be, there are many uh, challenges of doing interferometry. One is computational and the other one has to do with the direction of propagation of the waves. So we can actually have a kind of a semi active uh, uh, seismic experiment. And uh, these are the same uh, uh, signal, but now uh, high passed. So we remove the uh, uh, elastic deformation and we just see the surface waves. The nice thing is also that uh, you can see that different behavior if uh, a, a heavy and uh, long vehicles like a bus or a truck or a cab. So the amplitude is different, as was also different the one of the uh, of the um, quasi-static signal, but uh, uh, more interesting is that the uh, frequency range is less. You would expect that the long vehicles generate a longer wavelength signal, the waves than the short one. So you start to go wide for cars, you can stop at uh, three or four hertz. Uh, with cars and tracks, you can go down to one or two hertz. That means that you can in investigate a, uh, a thicker part of the subsurface. So you can start to see 50, 100 meters below the surface and there are problems developing uh, at uh, uh, those depths. Of course, uh, that is, uh, this is just for one vehicle, but on, on street you have hundreds of thousands of vehicles running every day. And uh, so if you can identify them, and uh, 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 you can uh, uh, then average them. This is a simple average of 33, but uh, 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 that was done by hand. But we are working now on machine learning system that uh, will automatically identify the cows. And so then you get uh, a uh, uh, higher and higher signal to noise to the point that uh, you can uh, think about have a reliable data on a daily basis. So think about that you, can monitor the subsurface under Boston continuously with a, a time uh, sampling of, uh, of days, and you can see how uh, many interesting applications there are. So this is a, a smart stack that picks when the event happens. Yeah, when the carries. Yeah. So basically, you don't want to summon noise. Uh, you just look at uh, uh, this. This data when the car goes and also you can track with the sources, so it has uh, additional uh, oh. advantages as well. That's that's the idea. And as we will see, you can also determine which vehicles it is, at least the axle, not exactly not the bow end, <laughs> uh, but if it is a car, or a truck, or, or, or a bus. And so you can uh, you can imagine that if you see a, ba a bus or a car, you actually use the signal also in the lower frequency. For the cow, you, you remove it because it's not the signal to noise is not good. So when you do your averages, you want to do smart averages. And then you can use very traditional. So this uh, uh, dispersion curves, that is basically frequency versus phase velocity uh, of the surface wave, then uh, very traditional, going back to Earth, earthquake seismology uh, uh, methodologies to invert for the um, the VS, the shear wave velocity. And here we compare to actually a known measure differently um, uh, as velocity. Interesting enough, you can also uh, start to see hidden forms. 
uh, that uh, are not necessarily known. So this is uh, a sequence of, uh, of five different uh, earthquakes, go from magnitude one to magnitude two, there were local earthquakes. And uh, first you see that what it looks like noise is actually signal because it's persistent. All this earthquake, they come more or less to the same place of, uh, up the hills. They are as noise that changes from event to event, of course, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, signal underneath that is persistent, so is indeed signal. But another thing that you may notice is that there are some areas that have much longer coders than others. And uh, uh, is one of the many interesting threads that uh, really we didn't follow up uh, completely, but we believe that is really the reverberation inside the fault uh, of, the, uh, of the event uh, uh, injected by the, the energy injected by the earthquake. And indeed, uh, one of the locations is uh, in a fault that was mapped by the USGS is uh, the purple one area here and uh, the uh, uh, located there. The uh, uh, green one uh, is not uh, been uh, mapped, but if you look at from a surface expression, it's realistic that there is a, a hidden fault there. Those are potential seismic hazard, uh, not necessarily with these small faults because they create earthquakes, but because they are point of weakness and you don't want to have buildings and, uh, on the top of that. So uh, that is another interesting uh, potential application is having very detailed mapping of the surface of the faulting in a city. Uh, that was the in initial uh, way of think that we were thinking about was uh, detecting local seismicity. So betting again, better estimate uh, earthquake hazard in uh, under urban area. Remember that some of the megalopolis of the world, uh, uh, starting from Los Angeles, San Francisco, Tokyo, uh, Mexico City, and probably many others that I, I'm not I'm living, uh, I'm not mentioning. They are in very highly uh, seismic areas. Uh, so can you actually better understand the seismic hazards in uh, those areas? And uh, so Pantin and her thesis, she basically built up a, a, a deep uh, network to uh, uh, detect automatically uh, seismic events from our small array, the one that we started in 2016. She built a, a catalog of uh, USGS events uh, uh, that uh, they were used to train the uh, neural network, and then she ran it on, uh, uh, on the data. And uh, also she looked at a uh, few of the seismometers that are uh, around Stanford uh, as well. And actually, she did uh, a, a detection of the DAS only, seismometer only, and DAS and uh, uh, seismometer. And not surprisingly, the two combined, they actually give you a, a better uh, result. So, in terms of earthquake seismology, uh, clearly uh, DAS is complementary, it's not substituting. Uh, uh, seismometers, but uh, uh, again, when we build the uh, dense networks, uh, I think that will provide information that we cannot do uh, with simple seismometers. I'm kind of, a, for the sake of time, uh, sorry? That's all right, you don't get, but you get an array. If it is uh, already start to have a dense enough array. So one thing that, uh, 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 we have started to look is can you can we estimate the azimuth and the angle of incidence if you have uh, an array and I'm collaborating with the university in Milan that uh, they actually we gave them the data and uh, they uh, have a publication at the and EGU. You have control over how the array is placed, like if you get what you get because they placed it a long time ago and you have. Oh, you, if you want to use the dark fibers, yes, you have no control. However, uh, is almost everywhere. It is really metal scaling it up. And it's not trivial. 
because it's not only scaling it up as a technical problem, but there are a lot of uh, legal administrative business problem because not necessarily company will give you access to the network, but the, 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 cable, the fibers are in cities like this, they are almost everywhere because they bring in internet to offices and residences. So uh, basically we had uh, 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 quite a bit of uh, the local seismic events. Uh, we basically uh, uh, found the most of them, these are from the, the catalog, we have few that missed, uh, missed more uh, by the dust than the seismometer because one seismometer is actually more sensitive than one dust channel. There is one the seismometer missed that we got with the dust. But even more interesting, uh, we got quite a bit of events that were not in the catalog. In particular, 181 events that uh, were not in the catalog. And most of them, you can, after that you look at them, you can see that indeed they're local seismic events. Here I have a simple movie of uh, uh, seven of them. And you see that there is some coherent signal that instead tells you that this is a, a smaller earthquake. And uh, of the six traces below, these are the uh, two seismometers uh, very close to Stanford and the three component seismometers. Uh, one thing that uh, is quite exciting is uh, monitoring bridges. Uh, again, most of the uh, bridges. Uh, they do have uh, uh, telecom fiber uh, getting uh, getting through them. Some of the really big expensive bridges, they may have a, a seismic sensor pre-installed, but the hundreds of thousands of old bridges around the US and the millions uh, around the world, was they don't. And the uh, uh, rate of fitting them is out of the question for the economic region. But uh, um, most of them, or many of them, they will have a fiber. And so this is a result from a, a studying a, a bridge in uh, uh, San Jose. Uh, we had also the uh, a fiber, and look at the data of the big uh, uh, overpass on 101. But uh, unfortunately, that tells you some of the challenges is that uh, uh, to get seismometers on that is not asking permission to the city, but to the state authority. And that is uh, quite a bit more bureaucracy. And we didn't do that, but it will be possible eventually. Uh, so the experiment here is on, on a bridge on a creek, uh, was done in cooperation with uh, uh, He Yang No, she is a professor in civil engineering uh, at Stanford, and uh, Xin Zhao Liu. Uh, uh, that is uh, her students again in uh, civil engineering. So we put uh, uh, accelerometers and measure dust at the same time. Why we put accelerometer? Because we want to get the result that we're getting from accelerometer compared to the dust. Because accelerometers are uh, a known, known quantity for uh, civil engineers for monitoring structure. So we have, want to have a comparison. So this is uh, just telling you what potential economical and uh, uh, also uh, human wellness is the impact of uh, monitoring old bridges uh, in US and uh, uh, also around the world. So this is a area view from Google, uh, from Earth, uh, Google Earth of the bridge. And uh, uh, we had five accelerometers and the dust going uh, underneath. Uh, Jin Zhao developed a nice uh, uh, kind of a parametric model, basically is a system of ordinary differential equation to connect the uh, uh, parameter of the bridge to the uh, recorded data. Don't have the time to go through. Uh, and uh, there is uh, a paper that is coming out soon that will describe in quite a bit of details. Uh, what I'm going to show here is that uh, the resonant frequency of the bridge measured by the DAS and uh, the one uh, by the, uh, uh, so the DAS is the blue line, the uh, uh, accelerometers are the uh, red line, there is a very good uh, 
uh, correspondence between those uh, resonant frequencies uh, measured in uh, the two ways. This is a relatively short uh, bridge, so it has uh, relatively high resonant bridges. The longer the bridge, obviously, uh, lower the resonant bridge is there. But uh, is not only the frequency, but also the modes. And uh, uh, so you can measure the uh, resonant modes in the bridge and uh, the, uh, the, the shapes, uh, the mode shapes, they call them. And this is kind of a reliability of the measurement. And again, for the sake of time, I think that I will skip. And uh, if you are interested, I can share the paper. Uh, we have done a, an experiment recently on a number of those bridges and uh, uh, in which we not only had the piezoelectric accelerometers, but also MEMS accelerometers. We have not fully analyzed them. We start to look at the resonant frequency modes and look like that we can actually, again, similar result to what I've shown on, uh, on the San Jose bridge. So it's not just a uh, kind of a fluke for one particular bridge. And uh, uh, as when the lawyers uh, have done, uh, we will be running another much larger experiment in San Jose. And uh, hopefully uh, one of the bridges that we come across is not in a good condition bridge, is one that San Jose knows that is, uh, needs attention. So hopefully we'll see uh, some evidence of the, of the fact that the bridge needs maintenance. Finally, uh, I will discuss the traffic monitoring. Uh, and uh, uh, that can be uh, uh, useful for uh, optimizing traffic flow, even in real time. Uh, we have seen some evidence, but maybe it's too little to, uh, to really to, to say too much. Uh, we may even be able to monitor traffic accident in real time. Uh, that will be a, a really a big advantage for the public because now the first responder may be sent automatically before that anybody calls 911. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is a question map, but I, my bet is that within 10 years we may have a prototype that autonomous vehicles in the city, uh, there will be an integrated system that include uh, this kind of uh, measure. Uh, not sure because the, I think the focus is to have each car as an individual to be autonomous, not relying uh, necessarily on other cars and so on. But I think that uh, uh, a solution uh, of, uh, uh, that is integrated using many different sensors. And fiber has an advantage compared to cameras that first, doesn't identify the driver. So there is uh, very little issues of privacy. And uh, two is that uh, uh, works day and night, fog, snow and rain, uh, that instead cameras, they, uh, they will have problems. They, uh, here is uh, uh, an example of the heavier traffic than before. And uh, uh, one of the things that we decided that to doing a good tracking, we need to extract uh, higher resolution images. So the, that means that we need to look what is the, uh, uh, basically the uh, time sequence or spatial sequence of the car and they convert that from the data. So this is a physical modeling and uh, it uh, basically shows you this quasi static deformation uh, as a function of uh, uh, distance and uh, as a, a function of the distance of the fiber from the road, because it's not necessarily under it. And clearly, it gets moved out with this uh, distance. And this is for point sensor. Of course, if you do include uh, the uh, uh, gauge lens, uh, then uh, we'll smooth it uh, even more, depends on the length of the gauge lens. Uh, not much more for the uh, green, that is when you're far away. So to have a good monitoring and, for example, monitoring accident, uh, having a higher resolution uh, than this, uh, in this case, will be the green at 20, 30 meters of resolution uh, is important. So we look about using the convolution. This 
important things is that uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, signature is uh, uh, constant with the velocity of the, of the cab or if you look at uh, over space. So there is a group in France that uh, uh, did that basically the convolution in time that uh, uh, the invariant in the signature in space is not the, the signature in, uh, in time. So, and that is the show is same cow going at four different velocities. And you see that the frequency change, path of the cow, higher frequency of the signal, but the uh, uh, wavelength of the wave number is not function of the velocity. So you want to basically do the deconvolution in, in, uh, in space and you want to do very efficiently. So the convolution is as old uh, as uh, seismic processing. It was uh, uh, probably few of you, and I wonder even if uh, Laurent knows, but uh, uh, ERL back at, at its formation, so the convolution of seismic data was uh, really initiated here at MIT in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and- uh, uh, I wonder if Van Vitel. With Van, Van, Van Vitel and uh, Robinson, I mean, uh, some of the fathers of, uh, of the reflections and John Clavout started working on that here at MIT when he was a student. Uh, they, uh, so they are well-established algorithms, but the question is if we want to do it in real time, uh, or what is the best way? And uh, so the idea is that you can build a neural network that uh, uh, does the, uh, uh, the, the convolution in, uh, uh, in real time. Uh, also taking advantage of uh, uh, the fact that the implementation of this algorithm on modern uh, hardware is uh, uh, very efficient. And uh, you could train the neural network on some synthetic deconvolution right here. Yeah, that's right. They basically, they, what it is a, a uh, out encoder. So you train the neural network to uh, have your signal plus the convolved yeah. that you know that. Yeah, the loss is clear. So that's, and then you have that loss there. And uh, you will see that is a loss with. Uh, L1 and L2, that, uh, uh, so that is the original data. This is with L1 and in DBU uh, uh, areas that are pointed there by the different arrows, uh, that there is ambiguity, how many vehicles and uh, uh, that they come together the, uh, or not. And after the deconvolution with the L1, it gets you a better result on the vehicles that are near you that have low, uh, high amplitudes. And now you can actually see differentiating the different vehicles there. Uh, that is, uh, we'll basically will take the cars going in the other direction as noise. So L2 actually will allow you to see the tool. So there are a few parameters that you can uh, uh, play. I mean, it's, again, sake of time, I'm not going to match in the details. Uh, but once that you do that, you can also track the velocity. So this is a, 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 from this piece of data, you can estimate uh, uh, the uh, by basically doing local beamforming, local slant stack, the uh, velocity of the vehicles. And uh, uh, this are uh, uh, from different data set. And uh, the important this is that the convolved one uh, and uh, is uh, uh, not only higher resolution velocity spectra, where now the velocity is the velocity of the vehicle, so you can give a ticket if it is going too fast, uh, but uh, uh, also has uh, uh, quite lower error because we do have a ground truth. But do you have an idea of where the real sparsity is? Like, is it L1 enough, or it should be less than one right now? <clears throat> do you know? I mean, is that a sense, or is it just sort of? I mean, yeah, that's because it's relatively it's easier, as we know, uh, L2 a much easier optimization problem than L1, and then as we get closer to L0, computationally they become a challenge. For the neural network, it's not very clear to me, but I believe that also for training the neural network with, the, if I remember right, from with L1 regularization was already taking more time than we went to, but that's the student C1 
the deeper work really can comment on that. But also interesting that if you deconvolve the data, you can also measure now how many axles and the distance between the axles. So that was a bus. We had a video of the bus uh, going through. So because uh, this is uh, smeared data, you may see, oh, this is a heavy vehicle from the amplitudes and uh, maybe somewhat long, but you don't know really what vehicles it is. If you deconvolve that in space now, then uh, you can uh, really see uh, that this is a free axle bus as the one that is that is used by the local transportation. And so you can uh, estimate, and that's going back to uh, the surface waves. You can have an automatic identification of the length and the weight of the vehicles. And so you know where you have the signal, the band of the uh, frequency that you have at least uh, good signal to noise. Well, uh, I would say that this is really a talk prepared for students. There is almost infinite amount of application that you can think about. So many more application will be discovered by you. And uh, uh, what do we need? Scalability. Uh, we do need a uh, robust and, and adaptable and scalable algorithms. So for one of you that are in uh, algorithm development, uh, I think that uh, uh, to do that, we need to combine the physical understanding with the machine learning, like in the simple example that I've seen. We understand that we do have a space invariant signature of the uh, vehicles, and then we can think about designing a, a, a neural network that does the job efficiently and uh, effectively. We, uh, uh, like in the case of the seismicity, uh, we can also think about using machine learning to uh, detect and uh, analyze all the different kind of uh, signal and noises that we see. And uh, quite important is uh, that uh, uh, planning uh, also the computational infrastructure. That is more for computer scientists, uh, if you want. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that that network, even limited at 50 hertz, was uh, generating, I hope that I remember why, right, something like eight gigabyte a minute. And uh, uh, so if you want to extract useful information in real time or quasi real time, depends on what you want to do with it, uh, you need to think about your uh, really data processing architecture as well. And I'm um, a little later than 145. Oh, and another thing is uh, we as a group, thanks to uh, actually the Air Force uh, support, uh, we uh, created a, a, a repository. It's called the PubDAS. Uh, that uh, there are many different kind of uh, DAS data. That uh, this is a public capable uh, repository. So if you want to start to play around with DAS data of different kind, uh, I would suggest. Uh, uh, look at uh, that paper that just uh, came out uh, in uh, uh, SRL uh, recently. Look, uh, the first author is Zach Speaker. He's also the one that did a lot of work. He's a system professor at the University of Michigan. So there you can learn what data are there and, uh, uh, and you can download some data. And our plan is to go this uh, repository. Uh, but of course, we do have a data size problem. And then this is a long list of acknowledgement beside the people that I mentioned at the beginning. There are a lot of organizations that help with logistics, with financing, and so on. And well, thanks for your attention. This is lasted quite longer than a, a plan, but I will be happy to if you have more questions. I'm going to see some chat, so maybe we have. Uh, yeah, messages. Yeah. Oh, you have a chat. Okay. Yeah.